I think if human beings didn't have humour, I don't think we'd be able to survive. I think humour is part and parcel of survival. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humor. Humorology is the study of how humor can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is one of the most respected and best loved stand up comics working on the British comedy circuit. A multi award winning film actor, accomplished stage actor and improviser who has appeared on the West End stage and screens around the world. He is perhaps best known for his breakthrough role in Ken Loach's critically acclaimed film, I, Daniel Blake, which won the coveted Palm Door Award at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival. Since then, he has been a much in demand film actor starring in hits like Walk Like a Panther, 23 Walks with the great Alison Steadman and Fisherman's Friends. However, there's a fair chance that he'd probably give up, as he might call it, the highfalutin fancy film star stuff just to play for his beloved Newcastle United. Dave Johns, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Pleasure. How are you? You good? <laughs> nice, to, yeah. nice to see you. Nice to be here. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here, mate. Well, I wanted to start right at the start and, and find out, was the young Dave Johns funny? Was the young Dave Johns funny? I think the young Dave Johns thought he was funny. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, it's the old sort of cliche of, you know, making kids laugh in, in class to hide my uh, total lack of hate, my total lack of interest in school, you know? So, and, you know, trying to sort of, um, I, I think that's what it was, was humour I used to get out of sticky situations and, and, you know, diffuse things. And I think that's where it, that, that's where I came from anyway. It was just, I always, my, my head was wired up to see the funny side of things rather than the serious side of things. So describe your circumstances growing up. What was it like? Well, funny enough, I was born in Baker, where um, where we shot some of I, Daniel Blake, which was quite weird. Um, shooting scenes on Shields Road, where I was pushed as a kid in a push chair and, and sort of brought, you know, when I was a toddler, I brought shopping with my mum. So that was quite, quite, quite a strange experience. But I was born in Baker. It's a working class area of Newcastle, you know, sort of... Um, back to back sort of houses with back lanes and, you know, t you know, big steep, steep back lanes where we, you know, in the winter, you know, go down on sledges. And in the summer we went down on bogies, which are like what Geordie's called carts, you know, and there was a big main street at the bottom of my street, Shipley street. There was a big, um, 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 uh, which Raby street and, I can remember, I don't know if I'm still alive the way we used to just go shooting across the road in the traffic and buses would pull up and all that, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was just a working class area, you know, and I found it an early age that humour, um, like I say, can get you out of a lot of sticky situations, you know. But my mum had a good sense of humour as well, you know. And I, and I didn't realise that till later on in life as I grew up. I thought, oh, my mum had a really good sense of humour. And I think maybe that's where I picked it up from, you know. Was humour important to the, the whole community at that time? It's it's a way of diffusing tension, you know? I mean, you know, having humour is a way of, of getting through um, bad times. If you can laugh at stuff and you can laugh at yourself and you don't take yourself too seriously, I think that's a great tonic for your mental health, you know? You've travelled around everywhere uh, doing stand-up gigs. Yeah. Do you think some places are funnier than others? I mean, because obviously Newcastle is a funny town. Where my mother's from in Glasgow, it's a funny town. Liverpool's a funny city. What do you think builds that humour? I think, I think, like, you know, the one thing I've realised in all the times I've been doing stand-up, basically, you know, which has been very lucky that I come from an English-speaking 
uh, country because that means I can play anywhere in the world because like, you know, not like the British, most people speak English, you know, it's an international language. So I've played in Beijing, I've played in Shanghai, I've played in, in, uh, in, um, in, in Cambodia, you know, in India, but so some really amazing places in, in, you know, in some areas have specific types of humour where, so, so if you're playing internationally, you don't be too specific. You try and keep it, broaden it out because we all human beings, we all have the same inconsistencies. We all have the same insecurities. And so, 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 you know, we, we you, as long as you keep it pretty general, humour is universal, I think. From, from all the times I've been playing around the world, it's, you, 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 you know, if you get it, you get it. So why do you why do you think that there are more comedians come out of sort of um, what I would call tough working class um, cities, if you like? Well, I think it's because of you know if you're working in a factory and you've got a job that's pretty tough, or you work in a shipyard, or you're working in a building site. Humour is a currency, you know. People use it as a currency, you know. Um, um, it's that you come to a place that you don't know when you go into a building site and you meet guys for the first time. It's a very good icebreaker to be able to use it as a currency, to be able to um, to, to make people laugh. Uh, people warm to you straight away, you know. Now, you know, there's different types of humour. There's weird, silly humour. There's sarcastic, you know. And, 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 and people have different types of humour they like but I think it's a it, it's a universal thing and I think guys for instance use jokes as a currency you know if you get a, a, a group of guys that haven't met say they're at the golf club or something other, you, you know some somebody will tell a joke to try and break the ice you know uh, where you know you find that, uh, that, that, that you know that's the sort of um, uh, you know most most blokes I find to operate on that shallow sort of <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I was uh, I, I, mean, I was up in Edinburgh one time, and um, I um, uh, Bob Fraser Steele. I don't know if you know Bob. He's a he's, he's a comedy writer. He, he's written for. He's he's one of the best in the business. He's a comedy writer. He writes lots of great stuff. And um, and he I mean him met. Oh, we hadn't seen each other for about two years, and we were having. And, and so we spent a couple of hours before we met his wife. And when we got to the pub to meet Ali, his wife, who who who, who worked for Baby Cow at the time, the production company, she said, yeah. she said to Bob, "Oh, how's how, how, how's Dave's um, uh, family?" And Bob goes, "I don't know." And she goes, <laughs> she, she goes, "You spent two hours with him. How do you not know how his family is?" He goes, "Well, it never came up." And she says, "Well, what did you talk about?" And he said. We just were pissing myself laughing all the time, just saying silly things, you know what I mean? So it's that sort of, um, it's a bonding thing, humour, you know what I mean? It is, it's a, it's a bonding coping thing, you know? It, that is brilliant because I, I recognise it so much. From yeah. The, from, the, the, we, we used to have a thing where we used to have a Monday night club where a, a bunch of mates used to get together <laughs> and get together. And I introduced something in there, which was because we had the same problem. And before we left, we had to give each other three things about our families to take yeah. home. Take home, yeah, because nobody is interested, you know. <laughs> it's just taking the piss and shit. What have you been taught to do for, for two hours? He goes, I don't know. We just, we just were taught to get the piss out of each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, now you are on international film sets all over the world. Do you think that that ability to break the ice through humour has helped you? Very much so. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, when I auditioned for Ken Loach, I did four castings, but and it was improvising scenes, you know. And I think because I, I, you know, people go, "God, you, you just popped out of nowhere." And I go, "Well, no, because that thirty years of being a stand-up and that thirty years of doing improvising, it was, it was like, it was easy for me." But, because I was used to doing it and I thought, that, you know, and I brought those skills to getting that part. Now when I go on set, you know, um, um, actors are different than comedians, you know, um, 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 you know, comedians um, tend not to take things too seriously. So, so you know, and, and, it's, and there's some great actors I've met who are good fun, but then there's other ones who take, you take it really seriously, you know, and you've got to sometimes bite it. But yeah, it does, I mean, going on set, uh, you know, after Daniel Blake, um, I went on on a big shoot with people like Stevie Gra Stephen Graham, you know, who's a brilliant actor, you know, yeah, and, uh, and and lots of people who had done a lot of of, of like a filming, and and I just come after Daniel Blake, which is my first film, so 
And most people, when you go on a film set, um, you know, um, take it for granted that you just know everything and you don't. So it's quite intimidating. So I've often found when I go for castings or anything now, or when I go on to a film set with them, if I can make everybody laugh, it breaks the ice for me, you know? Um, I, I can tell you a total story about that. I, 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 um, um, I was on, um, um, I did a film with Ayla Fisher, who was Sasha and Baron Cohen's uh, wife. And on the first day of film, and I only had two days on it, and, and it was the first day of filming. So the, all the crew had just got there as well. And this was going to go on for like, I think about like um, eight, eight weeks of filming. And this was the first day of filming. I had the first scene with her. And all the crew were new and all that. And I and I had gone to um, costume and when I and I got and I found and, and I was looking for boots and I thought, oh, can I have these boots? And they had Tom Hardy written inside, so they were Tom Hardy's boots. So I said, oh, so I was saying to people, oh, I've got Tom Hardy's boots on. So so when I got on set, obviously the director had heard and he goes, I hear you've got Tom Hardy's boots on, and I went, yeah. And I can't be responsible for any acting choices I make. Tom Hardy will be making all the factors. So we set up and we had inside, so we set up the first, it was the first shot, the whole film crew, first time. And, every, and everybody's nervous the first time on a shoot, you know. And I just met Ayla and she goes, oh, hi, and all this. And so we did a, a, um, a run through for the camera, just rehearsed the lines. And then he says, okay, well, let's go for a take. And he went, okay, action. And I went, oh, 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 and I just ran off. And I went, it's not me, it's Tom Hardy's boots. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and that made people laugh, you know. And that's in the thing is, it just it's about breaking the ice, you know. It's about it's about when you're in a when I get in a situation and I find intimidating because you know everybody deals with you, you, you know Stevie Graham goes. I mean, when he works on set for the first time, he's nervous. And he's a brilliant actor, but 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 you know, you're just sort of so. My coping is that I use humor, you know, and I and I think if I can make everybody laugh on my first day. And, and they laugh. I go, okay, these are my people. I can relax now. And then I, you, 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 you know, and I don't do it all the time. I take it seriously. But that first day on set, I try to get a laugh. You know. Well, I think that's really important for anybody who's listening to take away because I think uh, humour is the un ultimate mm. bonding tool. It is, without a doubt, without a doubt. And and when people are laughing together, actually, as a psychologist, I would say that they're also breathing in unison. And it's, uh, you know, you know, you and I um, grew up playing the comedy store. When that room goes oh. and everybody goes at the same time. Oh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And, it, and everybody yeah. is bonded uh, because yeah. of that. Yeah. That's why comedy works better in a small, tightly packed audience. Where everybody's packed in together because it's a sharing experience, you know. And that's why live comedy when a, when a club's full and it's got a low ceiling, it's all packed in and it's dark and it's just a light on the comic on the stage and he's really going for it and really motoring and on that wave and the audience come with you, there's there's nothing like it. It's a, it's a great experience. That's why people love live stand-up, you know? And then somebody sees you at the comedy store on a sort of Saturday night when you've rocked it and then they come up to you and they go, oh, oh I'd like to book you for a corporate. And then you go, all right, and then they book you for a corporate and it's on a... Saturday afternoon in a Chinese restaurant where all the, <laughs> where the, where the waiters are serving people and you're standing in the corner on the carpet with a little tiny mic and they go, oh, it's not the same. The atmosphere is not the same. And you go, <laughs> and you go, and you go, well, no, it's not going to be the same because you're in sort of, it's like an orchid, you know, you see a beautiful orchid <clears throat> in the jungle <clears throat> and you go, oh, I'm going to have that. And you get, and you take it out and, it's in, 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 and then you bring it back home and you go to Wolverhampton and you stick it on your mantelpiece and you go, oh, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't look the same as it did in the, in the Amazon rainforest. And you go, no, because that's where it was meant to be, you know? Oh, you yeah, well, it's so true, that, because I've had that, in fact, with uh, your mate Bill Bailey. I remember uh, some corporates asking me to put something together and I put some great acts together back in the day. And uh, I said, whatever you do, you have to set it up like this. You've got to have the seats here. You've got to, and you know, this is just basic stuff that w we all do. And we turned up and there was no stage and there were no seats. Yeah. And then they went, it didn't go that well, did it? And you go, well, I what did you expect? I mean, I mean, I had one once where I turned in, it was in a function room and we went in. 
there was a bar and there was no and there was no seats. And I went, what's in it? He goes, oh, well, 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 we just thought we'd all stand around having a beer and just listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, and you quickly become a bloke just talking. You know what I mean? You know? <laughs> I mean, I've done a gig on a nuclear submarine in the wardroom of a nuclear submarine where all the audience were all the, 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 the officers and they were all dressed and, and they all had dresses on. What actual yeah. female dr- women's dresses? Women dresses they had because they thought, oh well, we'll just dress up, so we'll put loads. Of- so I walks in, and there's all these lights with beards with dresses on, all know each other, sit in this on a nuclear submarine. There was about like twenty of them crammed in this like oval sofa in the wardroom where they have all the thing, right? And I had to do stand up in the corner, and I died on me, and I died on the horse, and I was going, and they were going, and they were going, and, and one of them said, and, and, and they'd flown me from England to Guam in the Pacific, Guam, right? So I had to fly from here to, to Tokyo, stay in Tokyo overnight, then fly from Tokyo to Guam in the middle of the bloody ocean. Uh, this new little thing went on, died on the arse, and this bloke goes, he goes, he goes, this is just a holder for you. And I went, yeah, because I phoned up the travel agent in Newcastle and said, could I have three days dying on the arse in Guam, please? <laughs> and, uh, and, but you know, so it, so you know, and and but I got away with with because they all knew each other. They 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 were all taking the piss out of us. So I just started. So I ditched the material, and I just started taking the piss out of them. You know, and that's how it worked. You know, it was like suddenly it was like they were testing my metal, and like you know, I mean, what what one of them held a newspaper up in front of his face, and I went, yeah, as if you can read. I guess it's upside down, man, and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, uh, but it was one of the most strangest gigs I've ever done, yeah. That is a brilliant story, that yeah. you, you, to go, go all that way. And then, yeah. well, mind you, they're on a submarine for a long time, so wearing dresses is probably not that strange for them. <laughs> what makes you laugh, Dave? What makes me laugh? Um, God, that's a question, isn't it? I like um, silly humour. I've got a mixture, really, because I like, I like clever, uh, sort of like... Um, um, like what? What? Like what? What? One, what, what one of my favourite comics was uh, was, was Chad Jeremy Hardy. Now, 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 right. now, now, Chad Jeremy can be very clever, but he can also be very, very silly. And my favourite comic in the world is Sean Locke, you know, because I love Sean sort of like to real crazy ways. So yeah, that tickles us, you know. But it's um, the thing about comedy is it's a very personal thing, you know. And I've often um, and it's and, it, and it's personal to every. Person, I, I remember working with Harry Hill in Jonglers, and you know you'd be sort of like standing there at the side of the stage after you had done your bit, you're watching Harry, and it, and it'd be a table of, of punters on one table crying with laughter, like bent double. And then the next table, people just staring, just not getting them, you know, and and then and then, and then, and then, and then they'd get really angry, and they'd go, "Yo, shit." And you'd go, and, and you'd go, and so Harry would, or, like, like, other people come to me and go, you, uh, well, well, you're not very funny, mate. So I've just gone, yeah, I know. And they go, no, 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 you're not, you're crap. And I go, yeah, yeah, I know. And what it is is they get really angry because they want to, to say, you, you're not funny. I don't think you're funny. And if you just go, yeah, yeah, I know, mate, you're right, I'm not funny. It, it gets them angry, you know? And, it, and it's very, and so I never <clears throat> take, take any notice if people go, oh, you're not funny because... I've been a comic for 30 years and I've got enough people laughing at me to know that I am funny. Maybe you don't think I'm funny at that moment in time. That's why it's a very personal thing, you know? That's why comedy can go wrong as well, very, very easily, you know? It, it, it's on a knife edge. Good comedy should always be on a knife edge where where it's... It, be, be, because your best comedy comes when you're sailing, sailing on the wind and you're on the top of the wave, you know, and you're just riffing, you know, and that's the best, but you know, you can misjudge stuff. Um, um, that's the exciting thing about live comedy, you know, and, and, you know, you, that's why I think anything is, is, uh, is up for grabs in comedy, but you can say anything you want, but if you say something that is offensive and that upsets, you have to be able to take the flack from it and you have to be able to back it up, you know? I mean, that's why dark humor and black humor works with, you know, people in the fire service and people who are police officers and people who are on, on the front line. I'm like, like, I mean, even in hospitals, you know, I mean, I know when we used to go sometimes at the comedy store in the dressing room, uh, we'd be a few comics and we'd be saying really, really bad stuff that you would never say out on, on, on stage. 
but you say it just because it's so bad just to make each other laugh and if it was and you go that's really funny but you could never say that on on, on stage you know because it's like you know it's 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 a it's a it's a it's very personal comedy you know if you're going to say something that that people might find offensive first of all it has to be a pretty bulletproof joke that you laugh without even thinking about it you know because you know you i, I mean Jerry Salovitz makes oh, me laugh. So, Jerry Salovitz makes me cry with laughter. But some of the stuff he says is so offensive. But because it's so good, you 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 can't stop yourself from laughing. And you go, that is so bad. <laughs> oh my god, that's so bad. But it just automatically makes you laugh, you know. And that's what it is. It's that sort of like it's that. Sometimes it's that good reaction, you know? You talk about sailing on the wind. How close do you have to sail to the wind in order to find those limits? I think that's when a comic enjoys it the most, is if you're up there and you're riffing and you're not thinking about it and you're just on that thing in, in the room. And what it is, is the, 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 other, um, the energy from the audience is giving you the permission to go further and go further. And their laughter and their whole sort of like permission is because they, they, they are with you and they're laughing and they're laughing. And, and so, you know, after 30 years, you know, one of the skills that you should have learned is how to read a room, you know? Um, well, you talk about reading a room, but because for our audience, not everybody's a comic, so that, but they want things to take away. So what's the best way to get an audience on your side? Well, you know, you walk on and basically if you can, if you can say a good example of this is, 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 is getting it wrong is when you go to a wedding and, and, and the best man gets up or the dad gets up and he thinks, I'll see a joke to break the ice, right? And they either pick a really inappropriate joke, which, which, which is <laughs> such a mixed audience where, where, People laughing because they go, oh my God. And then other people are going, and then the grandmas, or they pick a, a joke that just isn't funny and it falls flat. And so, so, so to me, reading a room is you go in and, and if it's a cold room and, and I haven't seen the audience, I'll throw a few little testers out just to test what that humor is, you know? But what you don't want to do is if you're a comic and you're going and you're doing like a meeting and you go and you think, right, I'll do an icebreaker. Is 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 get, is going and do a totally inappropriate joke, and that's the thing about reading the room. And people have said to me, like like friends have seen me and do it again. Come on, going, how did you get away with saying that? And I goes because they gave me permission because the stuff I'd done before, I thought, all right, they're going to go with this, and then and then you go, and, you know, and if you do, and you go, and then you can go, oh my god, is that so wrong? Did that say, oh my god, did that say that? You know what I mean? You know, and and it's and it's and it's that sort of thing. So if you were I think you've got to be very, very... See, there are some people who aren't funny. Oh, well, I was going to come on to that. You, do, do you think everybody can be funny, can learn to be funny, or do you think there is a funny I, in your DNA? I think with comics, there's you. You can learn to tell a joke, and you can learn to write a joke, but the best comics have got, got that thing they can just read the room there are some people who are great at maths there are some people who can play a chat there are some people who couldn't tell a joke to save their life you you can get a couple of nice little jokes that you can use in a meeting or you can use in in a presentation that you go all right well this works but i always say to um to anybody who says to me oh i'm doing a a, um, a best man speech or something like that and i go well, well, you know, um, if you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to, but because everyone wants to be like, like, you know, you have best man speeches where the best man's hilarious, you know? And I say, just talk from the heart, really, and maybe have a couple of nice little gags, but, but you know, you have to, if you're going out on a big conference and you're going to do a risky joke, that could be the, that could be, or, you could just hit it right and it could bring the bloody house down, you know? It just, it just but it usually does that when the person is known for having a good sense of humour, you know? And, you know, reading a room is a very difficult thing to explain. It's a gut reaction, you know? 
it's a gut reaction when you walk into a room, you know. I, I did a corporate once that was for insurance brokers and they all had ties and it was such a tough gig. And I went on, I was on for the first five minutes and I tried a couple of gags, I was getting down, they're all sitting and this guy was sitting in the front and he had a, I, I, I tell you, I'm gonna go, you could smoke, he had a cigar and he's got his drink and he's a big, and he goes, and they're all insurers, he goes, he goes, who told you you were funny? I, I, I come what I, I come what I said. I said, but yeah, mate. I guys, I guys, you're all insurance brokers, aren't you? I went, yeah. So, move some steps, and I came down onto the floor, and I hit him on the head with the mic, and it went boom like that. And I went, now you see, you should have took out comic random attack insurance, <laughs> but you didn't because you didn't think you'd need it. And I think that's what it's like for all insurances. People never think they're going to need it, do they? And they all went, yeah, like that. Like that. So you just thought, I'm coming out for a night. I'm not going to get hit in the head. But you could have taken out insurance for that, but you didn't because you're stupid. Bang, and I hit him again, you see? You could have took out double insurance on it, right? And I just kept hitting them on the head. So they started pissing themselves, laughing at him, you see? So he was all like this, you know? And that was me reading the room, me thinking, I've got to talk on their level. I've got it. I've got it. Shut him up. And I've also got it gun down there. So that was me thinking, by loads of years being a stand-up, this is how I can win the room round, you know? So so it's about, you know, I, I don't know how you pass that on, really. I think it's just a gut feeling and experience, you know? Well, I think you can pass it on in the sense of um, it's observation, it's listening, yeah. isn't yeah. it? it, it well, that's the next is... thing about the comic is listening. And a, and a lot of comics don't understand that. They don't understand about listening. And you go, no, it's about listening to the room, you know? I've seen comics when somebody said something and they've gone into this guy and destroyed him and it's all... And he goes, why is the audience turned against us? And you go, because you didn't listen to what the guy said. You know, you just heard him say something and you went, bam, bam, a couple of pre-prepared heckle put-downs and it, was, and, and, and it turned the audience off. And yet, in, But if, if you listen to the room and feel the room, then you know then that's what you that then that's the way to do it really yeah i think that and that's something that our audience can take away is that actually great comics like yourself are always listening more my my grandmother used to say god gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason yeah. um, and, and even though we talk a lot there is the listening where you're looking at people, you're yeah. reading their faces, you're, yeah. you're thinking, yeah. because people will give you, the, as a psychologist, people will give you signals and you've got to be good at yeah. reading those signals. Well, that's what you do in a club. And when you go down and you start talking to somebody and people go, how did you get away with that? You go, because the person I was talking to was smiling, their eyes were open. You, you, you know when somebody's feeling uncomfortable. And that's what I mean about if you've got a joke, if you've got a big room and you can do you know, a little one-off mild joke, which gets them laughing. You go, okay, I've got them. Uh, rather than just go in with a really, really sort of inappropriate joke. <laughs> and the whole thing is just going, <laughs> I mean, I'd laugh if I was standing back in the room and somebody said something totally inappropriate and they died on their arse. Comics would laugh at that, you know, because that would be funny, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, well, comics are a strange breed, aren't we? So, yeah, yeah. They... What would the world be like without humour? I think it would be an absolutely diabolical, horrible, miserable place. I think if human beings didn't have humour, I don't think we'd be able to survive. I think humour is part and parcel of surviving. And I think, you, like, you know, you always hear, oh, that person doesn't have a sense of humour, you know? To, 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 to not have humour... It's a, it, it's a really bad affliction to not see the funny side of life, to not, see, that's, that's how my brain is, is wired up. I see, I, I see it all the time, you know? It's like when I was over in, uh, when Daniel Blake won the, um, um, the BAFTA, we went to the party afterwards and uh, we were at a party and I was just getting a, a, a thing at the door, at the, at the bar and I saw Meryl Streep coming towards the bar, and I thought, that's Meryl's cheap. So I just went, Meryl, it's all free! <laughs> <laughs> and she pissed us, I was laughing. She went, is it? I went, yeah! <laughs> you know? And that was just something off the top of my head, but that, but I was thinking, shit, that's Meryl's Street, you know what I mean? 
but but that's because I'm always looking for 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 for, for that sort of. In in sometimes I have been accused of uh, not taking things seriously enough as well. I mean, there is there is there is a point where you've got to go. Okay, you've got to stand back now and sort of. But that's the way my head works. Always looking for a laugh. Always looking for a point of view that's funny. You know, always looking for that sort of um, gag. You know, I'm I'm standing on the stage of the Baftas. We've all got the Baftas, and Mel, and then they do it in are setting up the, and then they did the photograph, and then everybody was just milling about, and I, and I saw Mel Brooks, and I thought, he's a hero, man. I've got to go over and see him. So I went over to my guy and say, as a Brooks, I just want to say. And then I leave you like that. Huge fan, love everything you've done. And he goes, and he beckons his over to him. And he goes, so I think, oh, this is pretty. So he, he so he walks us away from all the people. And I think, oh bloody hell, this is all right. And he goes, and, and he's looking around to make sure no one's listening. And then he lent, he lent into us, and he goes, do you know you're completely bald? And then he walked away. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, I mean that's that, that's just you know that's that, and that was that was the best thing rather than him going oh oh yeah yeah thank you. because you could because people see that to him all the time you know it's, it's brilliant yeah, and what it's, and what a gift to give you yeah, really and 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 so you know and that comes from from the way his humour is and the way his mind is I, I would imagine I don't know him personally but I imagine it's very difficult to get a serious conversation out of him you know what I mean you know I find it like like you know in meetings I uh, I find it you know um, can't help but but every now and then pop a gag in you know what I mean I think that uh, that is actually something that everyone can take away. My theory is that um, uh, you can be the greatest actor in the world, but if you're a pain in the arse and you're not funny and people don't like having you around, I've worked on a lot of film sets, lots of TV stuff. I know what the world's like, but this is true of every office in the world as well and every building site and everything. The last person to go will be the one you like having around. If I hadn't have been funny, I would have never have got laid. <laughs> Women love you to make them laugh, and most of the most of my, you know, w w w women that I've met, my partners and all that, it's because I've made them laugh, you know, and 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 like you say, spending time with somebody who makes you laugh is a really nice thing, and. I suppose what it is is you need you need that sort of like humor. Humor is a great um, if if you can master it, it's a great tool to have. You know. Yeah. Well, you should try being more attractive, like me. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> well, we all can't be Paul Paros, can we? <laughs> uh, do you find yourself funny? I mean, as in you know, uh, because it's a serious business of doing it, but. You know, there's two sides. There's a lot of comics who I've met who are very famous comic who aren't that funny in real life. They take themselves quite serious and you wonder, oh, where, where does that come from, you know? But no, I wouldn't wish it on anybody being in my head. My head is like, I feel it's like, you know, the old steam trains that used to, in the steam train would go along. And all the smoke up. Now we'd pull into a station and they'd be standing in the station and every now and then steam would come out the wheels. Or they'd be like, trigger that to let the steam go. That's what I'm like on my own. I mean, if if, if if I mean how I write my material is I just rant in the house. I just think of a subject. I just I don't write anything like like I've I've I haven't done a gig for like nearly a year now, so I've never written any of my jokes down. So I have to look what's on on recorded. Because I've never written anything down, so I won't remember. So I just re 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 remember it by doing it. And so, so I'll, I'll be thinking of things. So I mean, I go around the house talk, talking to myself and saying stupid things. And I, I mean, I, I mean, my partner was, 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 was saying to me, she goes, she goes like, "You're insane." <laughs> She's. I've just been listening to you in the bathroom, and I used to go, "Yeah, but well that's that's how I've that's how I've I've got to get rid of all this shit in my head." You know what I mean? I've got, I've, and, it, it, and sometimes it comes out as as gold. You know, sometimes you go, "Oh my god, that's a great line." That you know, that's a, and it's just through me just 
thinking of something and then I try things out and I just go along and all of a sudden I'll go, oh my God, that's funny. And I'll write that down and I'll go, all right, well, that's the, that, that's the way I'll go now. You know, it's like, it's like hanging a map, you know? Don't you think that that's the whole creative process? I mean, a lot yeah. of people listening will uh, will do. I mean, I, I get called in to sort of help people become more creative. And I go, you have to set an environment that yeah. is creative. Yeah. You have to build that. And yeah, you're you building can. that own environment in your head where you can play. And, and children yeah. play and naturally yeah. do it. And what you've just described is yeah. playing. Of course, it's playing. I mean, I'm very lucky that I've done a job now for 30 years and it's just been playing, really. I mean, it hasn't been a proper job for me. It's been some a delight that I would have been doing anyway, you know. I mean, I used to be a bricklayer when I left school and, and I used to work on building sites and all I ever did. And any blokes who ever see me now and come to gigs and say, oh, I, I used to work with you, they only say, they go, you, 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 you were really funny. And you were just, they go, you were a shit bricklayer, but you were really funny, you know. And, and, and I go, and it's because it's it's just something that's, it, it's ingrained in me now, you know, it's ingrained in me. It's, it's, um, even, even when I've done sort of like, um, from Daniel Blake, I've had, I've, I've been asked to go and talk at places like food banks and stuff like that, you know, and in charities for food banks. I'll always, even though you're talking about a very serious subject and all that, I'll, I'll, I'll always, and can you see me, but you make them laugh, you know? And he goes, you make them laugh. I don't, I don't know, it comes naturally to me, you know, I don't know. And that's what I mean, like, I can't believe, I, I, I don't know how, what it would be like living without a sense of humour, you know? Well, I think you're right, it'd be a complete nightmare. Um, yeah. Is it important to laugh at yourself as well? That is the most important thing in the world. People don't, Some there's some pompous twats about. And you just go, if you just didn't take yourself is serious and I've done corporates where the guy comes on um, the manager and he goes, he goes um, I'm going to go on just before you and I'm going to have a talk to the guys and he goes on you can see the guys going oh not this one and then he'll do a couple of jokes that fall flat you know and he'll be really pompous and you go and, 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 and it's because he'll, he'll take himself so serious you know it, it's about opening yourself up and you don't have to be like 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 you know if you if you were doing a sort of like a, a presentation a corporate or something think i think i think you know you don't have to be mickey flanagan you don't have to be like you know the greatest one-liner all you've got to be is 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 humor the best humor comes from self-deprecation you know not taking yourself serious yeah, and I think that's so f important for anybody to I not think what take it is, it. Sometimes people think that if you are too humorous, people won't take you seriously and and it will undermine your authority. And I think that's 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 what it is. Do you think that in general workplaces, you said you used to work um, on building sites as a bricklayer and everything. Generally, where you've been, do people laugh enough in the workplace? Well, I think that what happens is it's that going back again to keep this that serious. Most workmates who are good workmates together take the piss out of each other. I mean, that's what you find. If you go into a factory and you go into a, and you go into the canteen and you go into the, uh, you know, you're, you're in a, if, you, 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 like, like, yeah, any workplace, if if you're good mates and you work together as a team, you take, that's one of the bonding things is that you take the mick out of each other, you know? And I think that's what keeps you going through the day. And if you, imagine if you're, on a on a on a conveyor belt, uh, you know, just doing some I don't know. No offense to anybody who packs chickens, but just packing chickens every day. Jesus, if you didn't have a sense of humour, you'd go home and bloody chuck yourself out the window, wouldn't you? You know what I mean? I think why people shy away from humour in the workplace is because they're scared that it the the work won't get done. You know what I mean? If people are joking on and being like, you know, it has to be timed right, you know? I'm sure when surgeons are doing a brain operation, you know, you can't have somebody, you know, larking about doing that. But, 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 but I'm sure in a big, tough brain operation, so, somebody has said something funny to the team, you know? And, and they've all laughed and that's got them through. It has to be because it's the way, it's the way for me, it, it would drive you insane. It's release humour, you know? I think it's important in a way that if you've got humour in the workplace, you have to also know when you have to be serious and when you can be funny. You know, that's the whole thing about reading the room again. 
it's knowing when serious needs to be serious, but you can lighten it with a bit of humour. And that's yeah. it. And if you get that balance right, well, you're on a winning ticket, really, aren't you? Yeah, well, it's timing, the ultimate timing, when to do it, when not to do it. Yeah. It, Read the room, listen to the room. And, yeah. and, and it's actually a much more outward process of looking. I mean, the humour with one person, look at the person, don't deliver the gag looking away yeah, yeah. because their reaction is crucial to that whole symbiotic process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a business question because this is a bit of a business po podcast as well. Um, if you had to make a business case for humour, what would you include in it? And what I mean is, like, why should... Because, you know, a lot of businesses are run by accountants now and they're, they're, they're saying, you know, bottom line is we need everybody's heads down concentrating on this. Why would you in introduce more humour? <laughs> It's like, why would you introduce um, compassion for a fellow workmate? Why would you? It, it, why would you introduce um, empathy? Why would you introduce being able to um, um, have the uh, when somebody's struggling and have the idea that oh, this person might need a little bit of point or a little bit of help? It's a human thing, and it, you know, it, it, it's all a mixture. You know, I, I mean, you know, you can't go in. Like, like I say, to a brain surgery with a red nose on and feet on his feet, and going up to the, the person, and you're going, right, we're just going to do a brain brain operation on you, so I'll just put you on that, way, and then blow it thing and put them on that. I mean, you'd go, I don't know if this bloke's taking this serious or not, you know. So it's about it's about it's about the appropriate and um, you know the appropriate, you know. But 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 you know, people have like, like I've had people say things to me that that out of context would be really, really inappropriate, but they've said it to me because I thought, oh, I can get away with this. And that's really helped me, you know, sort of like, you know, um, like, like, you know, for instance, I've, I've just got this idea of the anesthetic guy sticking the mask on you and, and then just, just breathe in, you just, just breathe in and then, and then go right, you know, just you go off and go in and, and go, I shot your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would make me laugh. You know, that or, 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 or I've got your credit card. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, yeah. I'm sure, I'll, and, and, and then you just go out, you know? You know what I mean? I mean, I, I mean that, that, to me, that, that would make me laugh, you know, even, even though I couldn't, because I'd be going on with, with, with that. But, but that would make me go, is that thing about, you know, <clears throat> they get it. Yeah. And it's, and, it, and it's also sometimes people don't get jokes. They don't get when it's when it's funny, you know, like like me and Ross Noble did a um, um, a radio show once, and uh, the guy goes, "Okay," and did it, and we're cracking on it. He goes, "Okay, well, uh, tell a joke, be funny." And me and Ross went, "We've just been funny for the last ten minutes, me, <laughs> but but you've missed it." Oh God! So, so me and Owen O'Neill wrote the sh uh, the stage adaptation of the Shawshank Redemption, right? Yeah. Uh, Got the rights off Stephen King. We wrote it in it tours now. It tours all over the world, and we were up in Edinburgh. And we got interviewed by this guy in Edinburgh. And he goes, he goes, he went talking. He goes, he goes to me. He goes, he goes. So how did you write the script of, of the short show, um, the stage thing? I guys, well, what I did was I went round at Owens one night, <laughs> and, and, and I had the DVD of the film. And we just put the DVD in, and then we got a piece of paper and a pen, and we just like wrote the stuff down. And he went. Really? And I went, yeah. I goes, and we're going to do a couple more films as well. He goes, because all the all all the all the words are just there. So just copy it down with a bit of pen. And he went, really? And I and I went, I went, of course not. I mean, <laughs> but you know, so so, so 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 you've also got to be aware that even you can say something really really funny, and people just don't get it. You know, like yeah. the Harry Hill story I just said, where one people and people are going, I just don't get him. I just don't get him. If I was like a corporate speaker and I was doing a business presentation and I, would, and, I, and I wanted to do some jokes, I would take like a sort of like, you know, one of those like car holds on that go. Every time I say something funny, for those of you who don't get it, I'll go, eh, eh. so you know I'm telling the joke and I'm being funny. And even if you never said anything and you did a joke and it did and it fall flat, if you went, eh, eh, everybody in the audience would laugh. You know, it's those little bits of stuff. You just go, I'm going to tell a few jokes. And um, I'm doing this series presentation, 
And just so for some of you who haven't got any sense of humour, to help you, what I'll do is every time I've told the joke, and if you don't get it, I'll just go, eh? <laughs> and then you'll know. And that'll get a laugh from everybody. You know what I mean? Well, in psychological terms, that's called anchoring. When you yeah. anchor somebody into a noise, you know, it's like Pavlov's dog, you know, yeah, and, you, you know, here's the funny bit. And actually, that's one of the things that great comics have is that ability to anchor where the joke is, yeah. you know, so they can just just look at a spot if they've anchored the gag and yeah. it will get a laugh. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky to have... Uh being able to do stand up, you know, it's my and even though I'm doing all these films now, you know, uh, which I love, um, you know, um, stand up's always my first love, you know, it's just it's it's uh, to walk onto a, a room full of strangers and make them laugh is the biggest thrill you could ever get, you know. But isn't it, it's kind of weird as well, isn't it, that, that, that you actually have to go into a darkened room and make people do an involuntary act. You know, it's like because people either laugh or they don't. Yeah, but it's amazing, and, how, people, but it's amazing how people will pay you money. To yeah, make it. it's great, isn't it? They go, I mean, the comedy store's not cheap. You know, 30 odd quid for, for you know, if that's 60 odd quid, oh, come on, let's go and have a beer. And these people are going to make us laugh. I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to do to be, but that's because people love to laugh, you know? Everybody loves to laugh, you know? Have you ever really crossed the line for you taking things too far i mean uh, when um, you've even gone that's too far in in my early days um yeah i i, I have once or twice i remember once saying something to um to, to a girl in the front row and she burst into tears and that was pretty um and it was just i, I, I can't even remember what it was i said but it was, but it was, it was inappropriate, and and I, and I remember thinking, oh god. But you know, I learned from that. You know what I mean? Um, well, yeah, but you have to walk the tightrope, don't you? Because comedy yeah. is all about pushing some boundaries at some level. <laughs> uh, have you ever gotten yourself out of trouble by using humour? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you can always, you can always sort of like, you know, like, like you know, use humour, like you know, when you get those cold call sailor uh, calls who come up and they call you up you know and you go in in like have like you know where they market and stuff and I remember somebody phoned up once and I said uh, I said uh, hello is that me? and I said, I said who's this I went uh, I'm from so and so so and so, so, so and well I'm a uh, chief uh, inspector Norris and I'm here at a murder uh, scene at the moment and uh, so, so 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 who are you I went, uh, um, I'm phoning up from uh, so and so centre, and I goes and I goes, yeah, but can we have your name? Why are you phoning up here now? Uh, did you know the, the deceased? And they go, no, 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 I don't know the deceased. <laughs> and he go, you know, because um, we uh, are going to record you now because we think that maybe you know something about us. No, no, I'm just from a call centre. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you can use your humour to sort of get out of, uh, of like tight spots. You know what I mean? You know. Uh, well, we're now coming to the part of the show which we call the end part of the show, which we call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. <laughs> And the reason we call it that is because it's quick fire questions. Who's the funniest person you've met in film? Oh yeah, I mean, um, um, Stevie Graham's quite funny. You know, um, the first day I got on set we'd gone for um the first day i'd, I'd arrived and i was in the hotel and uh, we had uh we we had lunch together and then and then later on that night um a couple of days later we did some night shooting and then i was in the hotel in early um late late like in the morning i came in about like four o'clock in the morning and then the phone went about six in the morning and uh picked up the phone and i'd only known him two days and i heard this book go Hello, this is a uh, reception. Um, we've had complaints about a woman screaming in your room. And I went, what? He goes, are you room 372? And I went, yeah. He goes, uh, well, we've had complaints about a, uh, a woman screaming in your room. I guess, I guess there's no women in my room. I guess I've just got, I've just gone into bed. He goes, well, that's, uh, we've had a couple of complaints. So, so we're, sending, uh, we're, we're sending security up to check because we think a woman's unsafe in your room. And I'm going, Honestly, mate, there's anybody here. Yeah, yeah, you can come up and then he started laughing. He goes, I got you. I went, oh, you shit, man. <laughs> and 
but I'm very hard to get as well. You know what I mean? So it was, uh, so, you know, so yeah. yeah. Uh, what book makes you laugh, Dave? I like books that have got um, that the humour comes out of the situation rather than, you know, um, a gag book. Um, a few of um, uh, a few of um, the autobiographies of uh, David Niven's books very funny, you know. The, the moon's a balloon. You know that's very funny, and in all the stories he's tell. What film makes you laugh? Without a doubt, uh, which is held up still to this day, is Life of Brian. I had that so many times on the show. It's the, uh, it is the best, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, Blazing Saddles. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they're the two that I could still watch now and still, even though I know it, still laugh me ass off at it, you know? What word makes you laugh? Cake's a funny word. Is that because it's got a K in it? I don't know, just cake. Monkey's a funny word as well. Monkey in a Geordie accent, the best. You can only actually say monkey in a Geordie accent. Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> You're bonobo, right. bonobo monkey. You can't say that in any other language, you know. See, see, even you're laughing when a jury goes, bonobo monkey. <laughs> All right, taking a little bit of a shift, because um, we're very nearly end. What's not funny? Anything that's not funny. <laughs> 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 I think you can tell a joke about anything. I think, I mean, you've just got to look at places like Family Guy, man. I mean, some of the stuff they cover. I mean, you know, and you just go, oh, my God. But it's funny. It's clever and it's funny. And it's not just crass and in there just the shock. You know what I mean? Sometimes people use humour like that and burn sacred cows and, and pull sacred cows down because they just want to shock for the shock value. And that's, that's nothing. That's, 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 anybody can do that. But, but if you can point out something that is, uh, you just gotta watch Family Guy. I think Family Guy is genius. I really do. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Funny. There you go. That, that's an easy. I, I want, I, I would love it to be, he was funny. That, that, that would be the greatest thing. I, I remember um, I did my first show at the uh, Melbourne Comedy Festival. And the day after my first show, I was walking down the street and these two young girls walked past and one of them went, funny as fuck! And I, and I thought, that's good enough for me. And uh, Dennis Hopper said I was funny. And he's not an easy rider, is he? Finally, Dave, desert island gags. You can only take one gag with you to a desert island. What's that gag? It's an old pub gag. And I love it because it's got everything. And it's uh, Jesus is at the Last Supper and they're all finishing up and he looks at all the apostles and he says, um, one of you are going to betray me. And they all look shocked and Peter goes, is it me, Lord? And Jesus goes, no, it's not you, Peter. And Simon goes, is it me, Lord? And he goes, no, it's not you, Simon. And Luke goes, is it me, Lord? And Jesus goes, no, it's not you, Luke. It goes right around the table till it gets to Judas. And Judas goes, is it me, Lord? And Jesus goes, is it me, Lord? <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love that joke. Is it me, Lord? <laughs> and it's just a lovely, lovely joke, you know, so I would take that with us. Oh, well, you can have that joke. And uh, thank you so much, Dave Johns, for making me laugh for all these years and being the most wonderful guest on the Humorology podcast. Welcome. Bye. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. 
please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.